It really does feel like the tide is turning. There's something in the air. And finally, people are coming around to have some common sense. Now, on this channel and in many op-eds, I have been talking about the evidence base to support masking children in school. I think the first time I talked about it is MedPage Today. Then I talked about it in, I believe, The Atlantic. I believe I've talked about it in Tablet Magazine. And so I have said, repeatedly, oh, I should not forget, also I've written a full systematic review and meta-analysis that appears as a working paper. But recently, many people have finally joined the cause, and we have articles in The Atlantic, in San Francisco news outlets, in The Washington Post, in The Boston Globe. These are all articles that are making a similar case. Am I remembering them all? There may even be more. Let me put them right up on the screen. There may even be more articles, and they're all making the case that what is the stopping rule? There was a natural stopping rule. The natural stopping rule was when all adults have been offered a vaccination. That's a good stopping rule. Another stopping rule might be when the 5 to 11-year-old vaccine was made available to parents and kids who so chose to pursue it. Now, of course, there are countries around the world who haven't so chosen among healthy kids 5 to 11, such as Sweden. The Reuters story, I'll put it up there. And now we find ourselves trapped. We find ourselves in a situation where there are no clear off-ramps. And the reason there are no clear off-ramps, of course, is when you don't know under what circumstances an intervention works. You have difficulty knowing under what circumstances you can safely stop an intervention. And that's the crux of the dilemma that all these articles talk about. But despite that, there's a little bit of recalcitrance, but I feel as if a dam has been broken. This is being talked about in many news outlets, including the New York Times, all pushing for some return to normalcy. And there are toolkits that you can gain access to. There are petitions you can sign to petition the California state governor, for instance, that I am an author of. And these are all good news. It is the path to normalcy. What is normal going to look like? I know some people talk about the new normal. There's not going to be a new normal. There's just going to be the old normal. We're going to get back to the old normal. As a colleague of mine, Zeb Yem Rojic, said on this channel, human's going to human. We're going to go back to the old normal. There's going to be an old normal. There'll be a few people, of course, who don't want to go back to the old normal. They can choose to do whatever they want. But for the rest of us, most of us, will slowly and steadily come back to the old normal. We'll just be back to normal. Normal as we remember in those wonderful days of 2019. I recently noted that the news coverage of kids and COVID-19 has been like a two-year-long episode of Dateline. It's got everyone quite worried, but the reality is kids have extremely good odds when they face this disease, and vaccinated or not, they generally do well, especially healthy kids. We have data out of Germany. I'll put a link to my substack below. I want to talk about something very interesting I read recently, and this is a paper that appears in the journal Vaccine. It's entitled, Impact of Prior SARS-CoV-2 Infection on the Incidence of Hospitalization and Adverse Events Following mRNA SARS-CoV-2 Vaccination, Nationwide Retrospective Cohort Study. It's a VA-based study. And it really looked at something interesting. You know, we know about the adverse event profile, but it asked for somebody who had SARS-CoV-2 and recovered, when they received the second dose of mRNA vaccine, they've had the disease, they've recovered, what is their short-term risk of adverse events? And it looks at hospitalization. And I will put the figure up on the screen, but let me translate this figure for you. It shows a clear excess in one-day hospitalization after dose two of an mRNA vaccine for someone who had the disease and recovered. Of course, this is another immunogenic insult of perhaps a similar looking spike protein, and the body is primed to attack it, and it does. And these people have a roughly one in 1,000 excess risk of hospitalization in one day. One in 1,000. That's not nothing. That's a real excess risk. And this paper nicely and elegantly shows, it appears in vaccine, elegantly shows that if you had COVID and you have recovered and you get the second dose, you have an excess hospitalization risk from dose two. That's not true in this paper for someone who never had COVID and gets the two doses. It's important. And I think I should juxtapose this with a paper I've already discussed on this channel, which is the CDC's own natural immunity study that appears from California and New York State. I'm going to put that figure up there. You can't even see it. You can't even see it because I can't see it. When you look at this figure, the bottom two lines are people who've had COVID-19, who have recovered, vaccinated or not vaccinated, they're superimposable lines at the bottom. They have very, very, very low rates of subsequent hospitalization from COVID-19, even in different waves and different strains. So in other words, natural immunity is quite durable. This new study showing when you get dose two of an mRNA vaccine, if you had had natural immunity, you face a one in 1,000 risk of hospitalization in a veteran's data set. There's going to be older people. I don't know what that figure is going to look like when you 
when you talk about younger people or people writ large. I just don't know. And of course, there may be a bias towards more men than women, of course, in veterans' data sets. But this is very important. We need to gather this information in different cohorts. What does this all mean? I think it reaffirms the value that we need to have some dialogue about different policies for vaccination. We want people to be protected against the virus, but the safest and most effective policies for vaccination have to vary based on whether or not somebody had COVID-19 and recovered or whether they never encountered the virus at all. That's not the same thing. I have to be very careful and clear because I think people confuse it. It's not the same thing as saying you ought to go seek the virus. That would be a foolish and misguided statement. It is acknowledging the fact that some people, whether they wanted to or not, they have been infected and they have recovered from this virus. And we have to acknowledge that in our medical decision making. Right now, we're asking them on dose two to face a potentially as high as one in 1,000 excess risk of hospitalization. And for what reduction in hospitalization from the virus if they are to subsequently meet it? I ask. It's a very tough question. It's the same question that's at the heart of the booster dilemma for young men. Because after you give two doses to a young, healthy man, the risk of hospitalization from encountering the virus is going to be floored. And so the question is, is the risk of that third dose offset by any potential harm? Or, any, or is the risk or the harm of the third dose offset by a broader gain in further reduction in hospitalization? That's really the question. And it is an open question. And I think it's very difficult to answer. And people like Paul Offit, expert vaccinologist Paul Offit, man who makes vaccines, Paul Offit, he acknowledges massive residual uncertainty. And I've actually spoken with some people on the CDC advisory committee, privately and formally, and they acknowledge there's massive uncertainty there. And David Zweig, you got to read this piece by David Zweig. It isn't Barry Stack. It isn't. It isn't Barry Weiss's Substack. It is terrific. David Zweig takes a deep look into the deliberations around the boosters for all. Now, this was the decision that, of course, led two senior FDA officials to resign. So, what's going on right now? We've broken the dam on one issue. I think we've clearly broken the dam on the issue of what will it take to return kids to normalcy. The issue that we need to break the dam on is. What is the optimal vaccination strategy for somebody who happened to have COVID-19 and recovered? That's not a non-trivial number of people. That's a million, not a million people. That's a hundred, that is a hundred million people in the United States, likely. We have a documented count of 70 million, but there's many, many people who've had it and, you know, felt sick and they may not have documented it. And globally, it's going to be in the millions and millions of people. Hundreds of millions of people have had it. Potentially a billion people or more have had it. And we need to have tailored vaccination strategies for those people. You know, I sometimes hear people say that the best vaccination strategy is a simple strategy that applies to everyone the same. The same for a 12-year-old boy who hadn't recovered from Delta as an 85-year-old person in a nursing home who's never encountered the virus. That's, I'm sorry, that's not medicine. Medicine always, always has acknowledged the individual characteristics of a person, like how old they are, what medical problems they have. Is it a man or a woman? Is this somebody who's seen the virus and recovered from it or somebody who's never seen the virus? How many shots have they had? What happened when they had that first shot? Medicine takes into account all these factors. It is not one size fits all. How can we simultaneously talk incessantly about personalized medicine for the last decade as we have been doing? And now in a moment, we refuse to do even the least amount of personalization that makes no sense at all. So I think this is the issue now. I think David is potentially breaking the dam on this issue. It's an important dialogue to have which is trying to sort out what's the right strategy. And of course, the right way, the best gold standard way would be to compel the manufacturers of these products. They got a lot of cash. They can run randomized control trials. They can run it in every permutation you can imagine because the question exists in all of these groups differently. You know, a 12 to 15, a 12 to 18 year old boy who had two doses in Omicron, randomized to booster, no booster, you know, get consenting participants. You could even power it to measure severe disease. It's going to be a good power calculation, but it's necessary to really answer the question, is it worth it to them? I think, and as Zeb Yemrojic acknowledges, as vaccine efficacy against milder and breakthrough disease drops, you have less of the case to make that one person's vaccination impacts broader pandemic dynamics. There is a model that's put forth by the Seattle group, the IHME investigators, that actually looks under a variety of circumstances what would happen if the pandemic had extreme mitigation or no mitigation at all in the Omicron wave. And what it finds is that Delta, extreme mitigation efforts, extreme lockdown versus nothing at all, is quite small for Omicron because Omicron spreads so fast. What does that mean? That means that these decisions 
that you think might be benefiting other people have much less effect on the pandemic trajectory than you think. If everything put together has very modest effect, individual decisions have even more modest or incremental or no effect at all. Of course, because this is a probably, if anything, an inflated model. So I think that's the issue to talk about next. The school's issue, it's still not done, but I think things are moving in the right direction. It's an important issue. Kids need normalcy. If we hadn't had a media coverage that was a lot like Dateline, I think we would have been better off. And the next issue is, how do you deal with people with natural immunity? Acknowledge that it may not be the same as somebody who has no natural immunity. And then maybe also acknowledge that maybe we're going to have to do some tests to sort out who really had COVID and who just thought they had COVID. You know, I think, I think we should be open to that. That maybe there's some people out there who thought they had COVID, they actually didn't have COVID. And maybe there's a way we can use serology to detect who actually had COVID and maybe have policies different for people who you document have COVID. Maybe we could do a separate randomized trial in people who don't meet serologic definitions but think they had COVID a lot. That's a different cohort. You know, there's all sorts of randomized trials you can think of. Randomization is almost always the best answer. It's almost always the best answer. It reduces uncertainty. Someone on Twitter made an excellent point because... I had been a vocal proponent for cluster randomized control trials of, of kids masking because I think it would be good to settle that issue. And this person said that, um, you know, people say that there's no equipoise, it's unethical. And this person said that, you know, right now in the United States, half the places are doing it and half the places aren't doing it. How, how, how can we not test it? And I said, exactly. We're doing it. You know, a, a, it's not a randomized study, but we're doing it and not doing it in a haphazard way, in a way that will never gather information. If we merely randomized, we would have answered the question. But I'm not necessarily sure if it still makes sense to do it in 2022. I think it made sense to do it in the fall of 2020. Uh, but in 2022, I'm not sure it makes sense to do because I think we're in a different ball game. We have widespread availability of vaccination for people who want it. And I think we are finally have to accept the inevitable, which is what Anthony Fauci says, that we will all eventually be infected with a breakthrough infection. We have to move on. This is yet another virus that will be forever intertwined with human beings and circulating amongst us forever. And so we just have to make peace with that and mitigate its damage, but also um, trying to delay exposure forever uh, no longer makes sense. The last thing I want to talk about, I got a new Substack post. It's about weather vanes. And this was something that I was ranting about in one of the meetings I go to. And uh, somebody, somebody pointed out in the audience that what you're talking about are weather vanes. You know, they blow with whatever direction the wind is blowing. What do I mean by that? There are all sorts of pundits along the spectrum. There are people, and, and then I, I farmed out, I, I, I debuted my idea to uh, Zebi Rojic, if you watch that video, um, and he helped me polish it, and I polished it some more, and I wrote a piece about it. And what's the idea? Well, of course, there's a spectrum of beliefs on all these SARS-CoV-2 policy issues. They're the zero COVID zealots. They think we can, I don't know, get rid of the virus forever. They're the people who are pro-masking kids, go down to two, keep it on forever. They're the pro kn 95s and KF 94s and kids and adults and let's do that and lockdown is necessary and have circuit breakers and you know all the pro draconian restriction group and I disagree with that group and I think they're doing a deep disservice. Um, I I have a little bit more sort of um, open mindedness about um, you know what happened in the early pandemic. As I said to Zeb, I think lockdown will be seen as bloodletting. Uh, it's not that it never works; it probably works for some rare conditions like hemochromatosis, but mostly it didn't work. It's a bloodletting kind of intervention. Um, but these people believe that it bloodletting works for everything, and I think that they're wrong. And they've done great damage to society by having such a um, unyielding view. I've done tremendous damage. I dislike them. I mean, not personally, of course, I dislike their point of view and what it did for society. I don't know them personally, and I don't care to. Um, then there are the people I agree with, uh, you know, centrist people on COVID-19. And then there are people who deny it exists, and I don't even know what to say. That's, I think, a fringe theory that hasn't invaded the ranks of the academy or the media. So I mostly, uh, you know, don't get confronted with that. So I don't think much of that. There's also the weather vane, and the weather vane is somebody who's omnipresent in biomedicine. It's the person who basically goes on Twitter, on CNN, on, on Fox, on all the, all the websites, and they're just reading, 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 reading. They never read the primary studies. They never, they never read a new, a new analysis. They don't read it themselves. They don't analyze it themselves. They just see what people are talking about, and they kind of average in their gut the last three days of opinions, and then they go on shows like CNN and MSNBC or whatever, and they regurgitate that sort of average set point, and they just keep doing that over and over again. And the irony is these people often have lofty titles. They rise through the ranks of the academy because they are natural administrators. They don't have a talent for these things, but they know how to tell you some 
BS. They know what to say. Take that middle position on every issue and you can't, you know, make everyone that angry. You mostly please people and there's a few people who dislike you and they do that over and over again. And I actually think weather vanes do us a great disservice because what the media does is they love the weather vane. Of course, why? The weather vane is validating the coverage they just ran. And the weather vanes, um, you know, they, 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 they also stifle debate because if the media didn't have weather vanes to lean on, they would have to bring people who felt differently about key issues like, you know, does a 12-year-old boy who had two doses of mRNA and had Omicron, should this person get boosted? What if it's a mandate for college? Let's have two experts to debate that. You know, Paul Offit and someone else. Um, let's have a debate on that. But they don't want to have the debate on it. They have the person in the middle. They have the weather vane who can just make them feel like, oh, well, we don't want to both sides it. They always use this expression, both sidesing it. My understanding of that expression is it's meant for situations where there's a clear right answer. And when there's a clear right answer, if you give false equality to two ideas, like that the earth is flat or that the earth is a globe, and you spend equal time on it, you're actually giving false legitimacy to the flat earth idea. Well, on a lot of these ideas, sweeping policy that's never been implemented in human history, I'll tell you something, nobody knows what the right idea is. And actually, you want a vigorous debate between people who hold different points of view on the policy. Because if you had had that for things like lab leak, if you didn't censor that, if you had it for things like masking school, masking in school, or even opening school, you might have made some better policy decisions earlier, like reopening schools more ardently and peeling back restrictions among kids more forcefully. And maybe when you walk around the Bay Area, you wouldn't see kids outside their school at recess wearing cloth masks if we had actually had some of these real debates. Because that, of course, is a ludicrous proposition that's not doing anything of value. So the media gets seduced by the weather vanes. The weather vanes, um, you know, they even write op-eds. But their op-eds, even their op-eds average kind of what they've been reading. And, you know, if you read the op-ed section, you'd be lucky if four out of ten op-eds actually have somebody behind it with a real opinion. Six out of ten are just weather veining the other four. It really is sort of a daisy chain of weather veining. You know, they're just plugging in out, plugging in plugs into the same surge protector into the next surge protector. It's garbage. I mean, I think they, they, they truly do us a disservice. And we, even though, you know, I'm in the academy and we think we train people to think in the academy, we don't. I think a lot of people lean on peers and colleagues and groupthink to get their own ideas. So tying this all together, what are the themes of this video? The themes of the video are number one theme. The dam is breaking on restrictions for kids, and that, I think, is going to unravel. I think we're going to get back to some normalcy for kids. Thank goodness they've suffered disproportionately, horrifically. I mean, they had no real champions. They were abandoned by professional organizations that claimed to serve them. They were absolutely abandoned in the United States. Um, people who say they fought for disadvantaged kids implemented policies that have harmed disadvantaged kids immensely. It's tragic. I don't know what to say. I think it's... Uh, a true crime, what happened with kids. Um, but I think it will get better. The vaccine policy, I think, is being led by people who are not good at thinking about risk. They're innumerate. They don't understand numbers. They don't understand low probability events. They are leaning on a playbook that is increasingly obsolete, which is, you know, the playbook for childhood immunization from, you know, 1990 to 2000 and, and, and uh, 20. You know, that's a playbook that's like, you know, pretty solidified, evidence, people agree. Um, they're applying that to a very live issue, uh, a, a novel <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, novel safety signals, novel ra age gradients. They're really applying an old playbook to a new problem and they're, they're over their head. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, every day I see them perform science or interpret science in a way that really tells me they're not they don't know what they're talking about. And I think they do us a disservice, but I'm hoping we're breaking the dam there as a natural immunity studies come out, as it's more compelling. And medicine is ultimately coming up with the safest, most effective medical strategy for everyone in front of you, from the young to the old. It doesn't have to always be the same, and it can take into account whether or not somebody had and recovered from the virus. And that's not the same thing as encouraging someone to go get the virus. Those are two very different things. And being able to separate that in your mind is also important. And then finally, the weather vanes. The weather vanes have harmed us this whole time. I hope that the media will actually consider having more debates, pro-con debates on issues, rather than weather veining. Um, I worry that they're not going to. And the reason I worry is I recently looked on Twitter, and every day I goes by, I see someone 
is mad about what someone else may or may not have said, and they're going to pull their music off some platform or uh, protest something or cancel their subscription or this, that, and the other. And I think that if you're in a culture where everyone is so unwilling to ever hear an idea that they don't like or don't think fits the bill, um, you are really going to prevent any debate on any substantive issue. You're just going to get weather veins. And, you know, nobody wants that. Weather veins, they're terrible. Nobody likes to watch them on TV. The only place you watch some of these TV is when you're stuck in the airport and they force you to watch it uh, coercively. Yeah, speaking of coercion, yeah, they coerce you to watch their terrible show. And if you're free and you can choose what you want to listen to, you listen to podcasts where people have strong opinions, you watch TV shows with lively debate, as I'm about to do as soon as this recording ends, and um, you know, you go to the content you want, and that's not the weather veins. They are repellent. Uh, they, 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 they push you away from TV. And yet they're the safe way that these networks can ensure that no one's going to say, we're going to cancel our subscription or delete you from cable or, you know, whatever these people say. I don't know what happened. I really feel like, uh, you know, I went to sleep one day, I woke up the next, and now suddenly is, everyone is so unwilling to even hear an idea you didn't think before. I used to like it, actually. I remember being a fellow and I'd go to some lectures where I really thought the person was wrong. And often it gave me a great idea for a paper to do to show how they're wrong. Uh, some of my favorite papers have been papers that kind of stick it to someone who had some erroneous belief, but people don't have that attitude anymore. They want the, they, they don't, uh, what, what else do they do? Oh, they want, a, they want a screenshot. They don't want to link to the thing they disagree with because that might inadvertently get someone to listen to it. Uh, they want to like kind of keep a barrier so you can't, you can't see how bad it is. Just trust me that it's bad. That's really, it's really a sad state of being. So, this was a long video. I hope it had some narrative arc. I never know until it's done. But what I wanted to accomplish was to show you the dam is breaking, to show you juxtapose those two studies, the vaccine study of um, adverse events after dose two for people who hadn't recovered, and what you get from boosting um, or vaccinating somebody who has a natural immunity, which is that CDC study. I think that's a, when you see those two things up next to each other, that's something to think about. So, on that positive note, I think I'm feeling good about this year. I think that the Dateline NBC, the Dateline news coverage is finally going to be laid to rest. We're going to be post-Dateline. We're not going to be afraid of everything anymore this year. And so I'm hoping for a year of sanity. So if you know, if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment. Hit that bell below. Follow my Substack. You can subscribe. Actually, I put a lot of ideas out there. I'm hard at work. I've got so many op-eds in the pipeline. They're all percolating, and I'm going to be tweeting them out. I'm going to be linking them to my Substack. I'm going to be talking about them here. So until next time.